The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. All right. Well, I want to thank you all for coming to what I've advertised as the penultimate course in this lecture series. Everything else we've done up to this point has sort of been building up to actually finally really using databases, you know, and hopefully you haven't been too disappointed at how long I've sort of led you, uh, led you, uh, led you along here to get to this point. But the, but the point being that if you have certain abstract concepts in your mind, that once we get to the database part, it just feels sort of very straightforward. Um, if we do the database piece and you don't have those concepts, then you can easily get distracted by sort of extraneous information. So today there's no, no view graphs, so I'm sure you're all thrilled about that. Um, uh, it's going to be all demos showing, interacting with the actual technologies that we have here. Everything I'm showing to you is stuff that you can use. I mean, so everyone has been... So I'm just going to kind of get into this, and let's just start with step one. We're going to be using the Accumulo databases that we've set up. We have sort of a clearinghouse of these databases on our Grid system, and you can get to that list by going to this web, web page here, dbstatus, llgrid.ll.mit.edu. And when you go there, it will prompt you for your one password, and then it will show you the databases that you have access to. Now, I have access to all the databases, but you guys should only have see these class databases when you if you if you log into that. And um, um, and so, as you see here, we have five databases that are set up. These are five independent instances of Accumulo, and I've started a couple already, and we can even take a look at them. So this is what a running Accumulo instance looks like. This is its main page here, and it shows you kind of how much disk is used and the number of tables and all that type of stuff. And it gives you a nice history that shows ingest rate, you know, over the last few bit, and scan rate. This is all in entries per second, ingest in megabytes, all different kinds of really useful information here. And you'll see that this has got the URL of classdb01.cloud.llgrid. And that's been, a you know, when I started it, it was an actual machine that was allocated to that. In fact, just for fun here, I could turn one of these on. Um, you guys are free to start them. I would encourage you to hit the stop button because if someone else is using it and you hit stop, then, you know, that could be, that could be, uh, that may not be something you want to do. But it's the same setup, for instance, if you have a project, everyone in the class can see this because we've made you all a part of the, the class group. But you can see here there's other classes. We have a bioinformatics group, and they have a couple of databases. Those are theirs. They're not running right now. There's a very large graph database group. It's running now. And just to show this is it's running, you see this has about 200 gigabytes data and then if we look in the tables here we see here we have a few tables here here are some tables with uh, a few billion entries that have been put in there and this is really what Accumulo does very very well but I'm gonna start one just for fun here if that works and so it will be starting that while that happens um, and so you can and you can see it's starting and all those type of stuff so we're gonna get going here now with these specific examples. All right, and I have these. Just so you know, today's examples, so it's in the examples directory, in the scaling directory, and two parallel database. So this is the directory we're going to be going through today. And, um, and then we have a lot of examples to get through because we're going to be covering a lot of ground here about how you can take advantage of D4M and Accumulo uh, together here. So uh, the first thing I'm going to do 
this. And go here. I'm going to run these. I have essentially two versions of the code. One that's going to do fairly smaller databases on my laptop. And then I have another version that's sitting in my Yellow Grid account that I can do some bigger things with. So, so to get started, we're going to do this first example, PDB01 data test. Okay. All righty. So in order to do database work and to test data, we need to generate some data. And uh, so I'm using a built-in data generator that we have called uh, the Chronicle Graph. Uh, it's basically borrowed from a, a benchmark called the Graph 500 benchmark. There's actually a list called Graph 500. And I helped write that benchmark. And in fact, I actually, the MATLAB code on that website is stuff that I originally voted, uh, uh, wrote, and other people have, have since modified. And so this is a graph generator. It generates a very large power law graph uh, using a uh, Chronicle product approach. And it has a few parameters here, a scale parameter, which is basically the number of vertices. So 2 to this scale parameter is approximately the number of vertices. So 2 to the 12th gets you about, what, 4,000 vertices. It then creates a certain number of edges per vertex, so 16 edges per vertex. And so this computes, you know, computes n max is 2 to the scale here. And then the number of edges is edges per vertex times n max. This is the maximum number of edges. And then it, and then it generates this, and it comes back with two vectors, which is just the list of the, the first list is a, first vector is a list of starting vertices, and the second vector is a list of ending vertices, and we're not really using any D4M here, we're just creating a sparse adjacency matrix of that data, uh, showing it, uh, and then plotting the degree distribution. So if we look at that figure, so this shows the uh, adjacency matrix of this graph, start vertex, end vertex. Uh, these Kronecker graphs have this sort of recursive structure, and if you kept zooming in, you would see that the graph looked like itself uh, sort of a, in a recursive way here. That's what gives us this, uh, this power law distribution. And this is a relatively small graph. Um, this particular data generator is chosen because you can make enormous graphs in parallel very easily, uh, which is something that if we had to pass around large data sets every single time we wanted to test our software, it would be prohibitive because we'd be passing around, you know, gigabytes and terabytes. And I think, um, I think the largest this has ever been run on is on a scale of two to the thirty-seven. So that's uh, uh, trillions of trillions of vertices, or certainly billions of vertices, almost trillions of vertices. Um, and then we do the degree distribution of this. And you see here, it creates a power law distribution. We have a few vertices with only one connection. And we always have a super node with a lot of connections. And you can see actually here the, the Kronecker structure um, in, this, in, this, uh, in this data, which is it creates this characteristic sort of sawtooth uh, pattern. And there's ways to get rid of that if you want. But for our purposes, having that structure there, there's no problem with that. So this is kind of a, exactly what this uh, degree distribution looks like. So that's just a small version to show you kind of what the data looks like. Now we're going to create a bigger version. Okay. So this program, which I'll now show you, so this program uh, creates uh, essentially the same chronic uh, uh, graph, and but it's going to do it uh, eight times. And the right, one of the nice things about this generator is those will be, you can, if you just keep calling this, it gives you more independent samples from the same graph. So we're just sort of creating a, a graph that's got eight times as many edges as the previous one just by calling it over and over again uh, just from the random number generator. 
Um, so I have eight. I'm going to do this eight times, and I'm going to save each one of those to a separate file. So I create a file name. I'm actually setting the random number seed to be uh, set by the, the, the file name so that I can do this if I wanted, uh, you know, if I, I'll, the, 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 the seventh file will always have essentially the same a random sequence uh, regardless of when I run it. And so I create my vertices and I'm going to convert these to strings and then write, the, write these out to files. And so that's all that does here. And one of the things I do throughout this process that you will see is I keep track of how many edges per second I'm generating things. So here I'm generating, you know, uh, about 150,000. It, it varies uh, in terms of the edges per second here. Uh, um, but, you know, between 30,000 and 150 or 180,000 edges per second. Because when you're creating a whole data processing pipeline, that's essentially the kind of the metrics you're looking. You know, some, some steps might generate, you know, process your edges extremely quickly, and other steps might process your edges more slowly, and that's obviously the ones where you want to put for more energy and effort into it. So we can actually now go and look. It's stuck it in this data directory here. And we just created that. And so we basically we write it out on three files. Essentially, each one of these holds one part of a triple, so a column, uh, a row, a column, and a value. So if we look at the, uh, the row, you can just see it's a sequence of strings separated by commas. Same with the column, just a separate a sequence of strings separated by, by commas. And then in this case, the values, we just made all ones, nothing, nothing fancy there. So now we have eight files. All right, that's great. We generated those very quickly. And now we want to do a little processing on them. So if we go P, 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 O, 3. The first thing we're going to do is read those files back in and construct associative arrays. Because the associative array construction time takes a little time, and we're going to want to use it over and over again. So we might as well take those triples and um, and construct them into associative arrays and save them out as MATLAB binary files. And now that will be something that we can work with very quickly. So we're going to do that. All right, so there you go. It read them in, and it shows you at the rate at which it reads them in and then essentially writes them out and gives us another example of the edges per second. And now you see we have MATLAB files for each one of those. And not surprisingly, the MATLAB file is smaller than the three input um, triples that it gave. So this is a 24 kilobyte MATLAB file and you know it was probably about uh, 80 kilobytes of input data. And that's just because you know we've compressed all the row keys into single vectors and we have the sparse adjacency matrix which stores things and so that makes it a little bit uh, a little bit better there. We actually look at that program here so we can see we basically are reading it in, and then what we're doing is we're basically creating an associative array. We, we read in each set of triples, okay? And then uh, the constructor, it takes the list of row strings, column strings. We just all want this, since we knew they were all one, we're just letting that be one. And then there's an optional fourth argument that tells us what do we want to do if we put in two triples, you know, with the same row and column? you know, what to do. The default is it will just do the min. So if I have a collision, it will just do a min. If I give it this optional fourth argument at sum, in fact, you can put in essentially any binary operation there, but at sum, we'll just add it, add them together. So now we'll have at that, in the, in the, in the associative array, a particular row and column will have how many, how many that, that occurred. And so, you know, we're, we're summing up as we go here. And then after we create the associated array, we save them out to a file. And so we have that step done. All right. Now, the whole reason I showed you this process is because now I'm actually in a position I can start doing computation just on the files. As I said before, I don't have to use the database. I can, if I'm going to do any kind of calculation that's going to involve traversing all the data, it's going to be faster just to read in those MATLAB files and do my processing on that. It's also very easy to make parallel. I have a lot of files. You know, I just have different, if I launch a parallel uh, job, I can just have different, uh, different uh, processes reading uh, separate files. It will scale very well. The, the data rate read rates will be very fast. 
all, you know, uh, it, it, reading these files in parallel will take much less time than trying to pull out all the data from the database again. So we're going to do a little analytic here. So I'm going to basically compute, I'm going to take those eight files, read them all in, and accumulate the results as we go. All right. And there we go. That's, we get the, the in-degree distribution and the out-degree distribution of this, of this result. Let me look at that program here. You can see all we did is we looped over all the files, just loaded them from in Mat MATLAB, and then basically summed the rows and added that to a, a temp variable and summed the columns and then plotted them out. So we just sort of accumulated them as we went. This actually, this method of just summing on top of an associate array is something that you can certainly do. It's a very convenient way to do it. I should say, though, and you can kind of see it here a little bit, you notice that the time is beginning to, well, it's not so clear here, this took so little time, but we'll, on another larger example, you, what you would see is that every single time we did that, because we're building and then adding, we're basically redoing the construction process, and so eventually this will become longer and longer and longer. And so it's okay for small stuff to do that, or if you're only going to do it a few times, but if you're going to be accumulating an enormous amount of, of data, then... Um, what we can actually do is we have another version of this program, pdb04 cap degree test. And you can tell that was a little bit faster. <laughs> you see here it's all in milliseconds of time. And so and the, the way we did that, and this is a little bit longer program. What we're doing here is basically we're reading in, doing the exact same thing. We're loading our MATLAB file. We're reading, we're doing the sum, okay? And then since I know something about the structure of that, that is basically I'm summing the rows, okay, I can just append that to a longer list. Okay, and then at the end, do one large sum, and that's and then and that's that's obviously much much faster. And so these kind of tricks you just need to be aware of if you're trying to do very. You know, people typically want to do large amount of data. If you just do the simple sum, that'll be okay. But if you're doing it a lot over a large list, that essentially becomes a, almost an n squared operation with the number of the loop loop variable. And this is one that will be be even faster. You can make it even faster uh, because we are doing this concatenation here. When you do a concatenation in MATLAB, you're doing a malloc. If you want to make it even faster, you can pre-allocate a large buffer and then append into that buffer. And then when you hit the edge, you know, do do a sum then and and do it and do it that way. And that that would even that's even fa that's the fastest you can do. So these are tricks doing very very large sums. You can do them very quickly, and all with files. You don't need a database, um, uh, and this is the way to go if you're going to be doing something where an analytic, where you really want to traverse most of the data in the database, uh, or in your data set. If if you just need to get pieces of the data in the database, then the database will be be a better tool. All right. So um, all right, we did we did that. So those show how we did worked with files. All right, and that's always a good place to start. Uh, even if you are working with the database, if you find that you're doing one query over and over again, that you're going to be then working with that data, a lot of times better just do that query and then save those results to a file and then just work with that file while you're doing it. And again, this is something that people often do in our business. All right, now we're going to get to the actual database part of it. Okay, so... First thing we're going to do is we have to set up our database. We're going to create some tables in Accumulo. And so we want to create those first so they're, they're, they're created properly. And so I'm going to show you the program that does that. The first thing they're going to do, it's going to call a db setup command. And so let me 
this, this program, I'm going to now show you that. And so when you run these examples, you will have to modify this DB setup program. Okay. So the first thing you, you'll, you'll notice is that uh, we're all using the same, or each group that's, that's, that's with those databases is all using one user account. And you can say, well, that's not the, you know, the best way to do it. Well, it's very consistent with the group structure in that it's basically you're all users, you're, you're the database is there to share data amongst your group. And so it is not an uncommon practice to have a single user account in which you put that data. So we have a bit of a namespace problem. If you all just ran this example together, you'd all create the exact same table and all you know fill it up. So the first thing we're going to do is just prepend the tables. And I would suggest you put your name, you re replace instead of having my name there, you, you put your name there. And then we have a special command here called DB setup LL grid, which basically creates a binding to a database just using the name of the database. So it's a special function. That's not a generic function. It only works with our LL grid system. And it only works if you have mounted the LL grid file system. So let me hide all this stuff here. So as you see here, I have mounted the yellow grid file system, okay? And, uh, and, and you need to do that because the DB setup command, when it binds to the database, it actually goes get the keys from the yellow grid file system. And those keys are sitting in the group directory for that. So basically from a password management perspective, all we need to do is add you to the group, and then you have access to the database. Or if we remove you from the group, you no longer have access to the database. So that's how we do. Otherwise, we'd have to distribute uh, 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 keys to, 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 to every single user all the time. And so this is, this is why we do that. So this greatly simplifies it, but you will not be able to make a connection to, the L to one of these databases unless you are either logged into your LL Grid account or if you're on your computer, you've mounted the, the, the file system, and D4M knows where to look for the keys uh, when, you, when you pass in that setup command. All right, here, so, so if we look at that again, so, uh, and this is just a shorthand for the full DB server command. So if you were connecting some to some database directly other than one of these, or you could even do it with these, you would have to pass in essentially a five argument thing, which is the, the, uh, the, uh, the host name of the computer and the port, the name of the instance, um, the name of the, I guess there's a couple instance names here, and then the name of the user, and then an actual password. And so that's the generic way to connect in general. But for the, uh, those of you connected to LL Grid, uh, we, can, we can just use this shorthand, which is very nice. Then we're going to build uh, a couple of tables. So we have these. Uh, first thing we're going to do is we're going to want to create a table that's going to hold that adjacency matrix that I just created in, in, with the files. And so um, we're going to do that with a database pair. So if we have our database object here, and we give it two string names, it will know to create two tables. In, uh, in the database and return a binding to that table that's a pair, it's a transposed pair. So whenever we do an insert into that table, it will insert you know, the row and the column and, in one table and then flip those and, and insert the column and the row in the other table. And then whenever you do a lookup, it will know if it's doing a row lookup to look on one table and if it's doing a column lookup to do on the other table. And this will allow you to do fast lookups of both rows and columns and makes it all nice for you. We're also going to want to take advantage of Accumulus built-in ability to sum as we insert. And so we're going to create something that's going to hold the, 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 the degree uh, as, as we go. Uh, very useful to have these statistics uh, because a lot of times you want to look up something. and then you, But the first thing you want to do is just see, well, how many of there are in there? Uh, and so if you create a, essentially a column vector uh, with that information, it's very helpful. Uh, later, we're going to do something where we actually store the edges, the raw edges that were created. 
So when we create the, uh, uh, the adjacency matrix, we actually lose a little bit of information. And so when we create this edge matrix, we'll be able to preserve that matrix, that information. And, um, and likewise, we'll be doing the tallies of the edges in that as well. So that's what this does. That's the setup. You'll need to modify that. And this program here actually, uh, uh, basically, in a, in a, after the setup is done, it adds these accumulator things by designating certain columns to be com what they call combiners. So in this adjacency degree table, I've said, oh, I want to create two new columns, an out degree, an in degree column, and the operation that I want to be applied when there are collisions on those values is sum. It will then sum the values. And likewise, with the edge, I only have, since, since I only have one, I'm going to have degree and sum there. All right, so that's how we do that. So if we now go to our database page here. So you can see class DB3, it started. We can actually view the info. And this is what a nice, fresh, never before used Accumulo instant looks like. It has very little data. It has one table, a metadata table and a trace table. This is what, and, and uh, you know, there's no, no errors or anything like that. It's a very clean instance. And you can actually, uh, and, and uh, uh, so, so that's what it looks like. We're going to use one that we've already started, though, which is uh, DB1. And uh, if we look at the tables here, there's already some tables. Michelle ran a practice run on this. Chance up ran a practice run. I'm going to now create those tables by five, set up test. All right, there, it created all those tables. You now see, did it actually work? Here, so if I refresh that, and you can see it's now created these six tables which are empty. Um, we do have abilities to set the write and read permissions of these tables. So right now, everyone has the ability to read and write and delete everyone else's tables in this class database. In a project, that's not such a difficult thing to manage. You all know that. But you could imagine in a situation where everyone's, look, we had a big ingest. This is a, a corpus of data. We don't want anybody. We can actually make the permissions. We can make it read only so that no one, no one can delete, or we can make it so it's still read and write, but it can't be deleted, whole cloth, those permissions exist. Uh, a feature we will add to this database manager will also be a checkpoint feature. So for instance, if you did a big ingest, have a bunch of data that you're very happy with, you can checkpoint it. You know, you will, you'll have to stop the database, then you can create a checkpoint of that stop database, uh, name checkpoint, and then you can restart from that if for some reason your database gets corrupted. As I like to say, Accumulo, like all other databases, is stable for production, but it can be unstable for development. New database users, the database will train you in terms of the things that you should not do to it. And so over time, you will not do the things that destroy data or cause your database to be very unhappy. And then you'll have a nice production database because you will only do things that make it happy. But in that phase where you're learning, or you're experimenting with things. As with all databases, any database, it's easy to do commands that will put the database in a fairly unhappy state, even to the point of corrupting or losing the data. So, um, yeah, so, so, but for the most part, once it's uh, up and running in production, and we have a, a database that's been running for almost two years continuously using a very old version of this software. So, it just continues to hum away. It's got billions of entries in it, you know. And we're not really, but it's on a single, it's running on a single Mac, you know. And so it's, uh, so it, it definitely, uh, we've seen uh, situations where it's, like all other data, it has the same stability of, as just about any other database. So now we've created these tables, and let's insert some data into them. Okay, so I do... EDB06. So I'm now going to insert the adjacency matrix. There. And now it's basically e reading in each file and ingesting uh, that, that data. That's not a lot of data. It doesn't take very long. 
And now you can see here that data has been ingested. And you see there. So we just inserted about 62,000 in each of those two tables and 25,000, which for a cumulo is a trivial amount. You know, we just inserted 150,000 entries into a, a database, which is pretty impressive, you know, to, to be able to do that in, you know, essentially the blink of an eye. And that's really the real power of a cumulo is this, you know, on a lot of other databases, 150,000 entries, you're talking about a few minutes. And here it's just you wouldn't even think about doing that twice. Um, all right. So we can take a look at that program. So here we go. So we had eight files here and basically we loaded the data. And basically one thing we have to remember is that our adjacency matrix has numeric values in, its, in, its, in, in the associative array and a cumulo can only hold strings. So we have to call the num to string function which will convert those numbers into strings uh, to be to be stored. So the first thing we do is we can we we do we read in we load our adjacency matrix A, we convert it the numeric values to strings, and then we just do a put. So we can just insert the associative array directly into the adjacency matrix and it knows it pulls apart the triples and it knows how to uh, you know take care of the fact that it recognizes this is a transpose table pair and it does that that in, uh, in just for you. And likewise, same thing here. Now on these other things, we pulled it out, we we summed it, converted to strings to do the out degree, and the same thing to do the in degree. And so this is actually where the adjacency matrix comes in very handy because when we're doing accumulating, if we didn't first sum it and then do it, we would be if we put those raw triples into to to insert, we're essentially redoing the complete insert. And so this saves you know, usually an order of magnitude in number of inserts by basically doing the sum in our D4M program first and then just inserting those sum values. Just a nice way to, to save the database a little bit of trouble in, uh, in doing that. And so we certainly recommend this type of approach for doing that. All right. Let's see that there. So the next one, DB7. So now we're going to do a query. We're going to get some data out of that uh, table. Yeah. All right, and so what we did here is we said I want to pick a hundred random vertices. Okay, so in this case, I randomly generate a uh, hundred random vertices over the range uh, one to a thousand. Okay, and um, I then convert those to a string because these are numerical error values and I will look up strings. And then the first thing I'm going to do is I want to look up the degrees essentially of those vertices. So I have my sum table here called T adjacency degree. I'm going to pass those strings in and then I'm going to get just the degrees. So that's just a big long skinny vector. Looking things up from that is it takes much less time than looking up whole rows and it's in it or columns and it stores all those values for me so that's a great place to start and then I want to say you know what I only care about degrees that have been a t particular range this is a very common thing to do there'll be <coughs> vertices that are so common you're like I don't care about those I don't I, I, I have their tally and I, I these are sometimes called super nodes and 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 doing anything with those is a waste of my time and forces me to end up traversing enormous swaths of the database so I'll set a, uh, an upper uh, threshold here and a lower threshold. So basically I take a degree, I'm just going to look at the out degree, and I say I want things that are greater than the min and less than the max, and I want to get just those rows. So that's this query, a fairly complicated thing, uh, analytic here done in just uh, sort of one line. And now a new set of uh, vertices, which are just the rows that satisfy this requirement. And then I'm going to look those up again. So I'm just going to look up the ones that satisfy those. And I'm going to get the, the whole row of those things. So before I was just looking up their counts, now I'm going to get the whole row. And I know that there's none that have more than this certain value or, or have too few. And then I'm going to um, plot it. And so if we look at the figure, 
there we see. So these are, we ended up finding one, two, three, four uh, rows that had between, let's see, these should all write one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So that's between five and ten. These should all be between five and ten. And then this shows what their actual column column was. And so that's a very uh, quick example of that kind of analytic. Very, and again, very real bread and butter. And this is basically standard from a signal pro processing perspective. The max is our clutter threshold. We don't want that. It's too bright. And then, you know, we'll have a noise threshold. Like, we don't care anything that's below a certain value. And this sort of narrows in on the signal. Same kind of processing and signal processing. We're doing it here on graphs. And Accumulo supports that very, very nicely for us. All righty. So let's move on to the next example. And actually, if we look here, if we go back to the overview. So you see here, that was that ingest I did. This is the ingest, so very quick. It's getting about 5,000 inserts a second, but that was over a very short period of time. You can't even, it doesn't even have time to get reach its full rise time there. And then you can see the scan rate, and it was very small. It was a very tiny amount, you know, type of thing. As we do larger data sets, you'll really see that. And this is a great tool here, you know. Uh, it, it really kind of shows you what's really going on. Um, always, before you use the database, always check this page. If you can't get to the page of the database, you're not going to be able to get to the database. There is no point in doing anything with D4M if, the, if this page is not responding. Okay. Likewise, if you look at this and you see this thing is just hammering, you know, away, and you're getting, you know, seeing hundreds of thousands or millions of inserts a second, it means that guess what? Someone is probably using your database, and you might want to either pick a different database or find out who that is and say, hey, when are you going to be done or something like that. Likewise, on the scan side, you know. Uh, likewise. When you do inserts, you want to see, well, you'll get some examples here of the kinds of rates you should be seeing. You want to make sure you're seeing those rates. If you're not seeing those rates, if you're basically just, you know, using the resource but only inserting at a low rate, then you're actually doing yourself and everybody else's disservice. You're, you're using the database, but you're using it inefficiently. And it's much better to have your inserts go fast because then you're out of the way, you know, your work gets done quicker, and then you're out of everybody else's way quicker too. So, so this is a very, I, I highly recommend people People look at this uh, to see what's going on. All right, so I think the last one was seven. So we'll move on to eight here. So now we're going to do another type of query. We're going to do a little bit more sophisticated query. That query used the degree tables to sort of prune our query. So we didn't have to get, you think about it like there was probably an edge in there that had like 100 entries, you know, and we just were able to avoid that, never had to touch that edge. But if we had had touched it, you know, that could have been a much bigger query. You might be like, well, 100 doesn't sound bad. Well, it's easy to get databases where you'll have some, some rows with a million entries or columns with a million uh, entries or a billion entries. And you really don't want to have to query those rows or columns because they will just, you know, send back so much uh, data. But you can still have situations where you're doing queries that are going to take, they're going to send back a lot of data, more data that you can really handle uh, uh, you know, in your in your memory segment. So we have a thing called an iterator. So we've created an iterator that allows you to set up a query and have it work through it. Now this table is so small that you only won't really get to see the iteration happening. But uh, but it, but I'll show you the setup. So we'll do that. All right. So this is very quick. So essentially we're doing a similar thing. We're creating a random set of vertices here, about 100, getting uh, creating you know a bit over the range uh, uh, one to 1,000, and we're creating an iterator here called T adjacency iterator. So the the we do we we it's this function here iterator. We pass in the table, and then we have a flag which is elements, which is how many entries do we want this iterator? It's the chunk size. How many entries do we want this iterator to return every single time we call it? And here we've set max element to be a pretty small number to be a thousand. Okay, so we're saying is every single time we do this. Query, we want you to return a thousand at a time. Now, for those of you who are MATLAB aficionados, uh, uh, this should be, you should be in awe because uh, MATLAB is, is supposed to be a stateless language. 
and there's nothing more stateful than an iterator. And so we have tricked MATLAB with a combination of MATLAB on the surface and some hidden Java under the covers to make it look, have the feel of MATLAB, yet hold, hold state. So, uh, so now what we're going to do is we're going to, this just creates the iterator. Um, we then initialize the query by actually passing in a query. So we now say, okay, the query we want is over this, this uh, set of rows here. And so we're going to run the query the first time and do, and since that thing returns string values and we want numbers, we have to do a string to num, and that's our first associative array. That's the result of the first query. Uh, we then initialize our, our tally uh, here, and then we just do a while on this result. Okay, so we're going to say, oh, if there's something there, then we want to sum that and add it to our tally, to our in degree tally, and then we call it again. So we do the next round of the iteration by just calling the object with empty, with no argument, and it will just, oh, it'll just, it'll just run it until the query is empty. If we put in an argument, it would reinitialize the iterator to that new query, and so you don't have to create a new iterator every single time you want to put in a different query. You can reuse the object, but um, not that it really matters, um, but this is how you get it to do again. So it's a pretty elegant syntax for basically doing an iterator and allows you to deal with uh, uh, things very nicely. And uh, as we see here, then we did the calculation um, here, which is, all right, I wanted to then return the value with the, um, with the largest maximum degree. So basically, I compute the max, I get the adjacency matrix of the, of the degree, and I compute its maximum, and then I set that equal to in degree, and it tells me that the first vertex had a degree of 14 in this query, which makes sense in the Kronecker matrix, that first, that one, one is always the largest and densest, uh, densest uh, uh, value. So that's just how we use iterators. Let us continue on here. All right, now I'm going to use iterators in a more complicated way to do a, a, a join. So a join is where I want to basically, uh, maybe there's a, a row in the table, and I only want the rows that have one type of, you know, have, 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 have both of a certain type of value in them. So for instance, like if I had a table of network records, I might like, look, please only return records that have this source IP and uh, are talking to this domain name. Okay, so we have to figure out how we do joins in this type of, in this, in this technology, so I'm going to do that, so let me run that. All right, there's our join. So a little bit more complicated, obviously we're building up sort of fairly complicated analytics here. So uh, I uh, create my, uh, my iterator limit here, I'm going to pick two columns to join, column one, column two. And this just does a simple join over those columns. So basically what I'm doing is I'm getting, I'm saying, please return all the columns that contain, this is an or, basically either column one or two. I'm going to then convert those values, which would have been string values of numerics, to just zeros or one. Then I'm going to sum that. So I'm basically, I got the two columns. I converted all the values to one. I'm going to sum them together, okay, and, and then I'm going to ask the question, where were those equal to 2? Those show me the records, so that's what I'm doing here. I'm saying those equal to 2, so that shows me all the records where that value is equal to 2, and I can then get the row of those things and then pass that back in to the original matrix, okay, and now... I know now I will get back those rows with those things. And so we can see that. I think that's the first figure that we did here. So we go to figure one. And those show basically, what did we do? Right. So. This shows us the complete rows of all the records that had the value 1. So this is here, 1, and I think it was 100 
which is somewhere, right, like probably in there. So there's, you know, basically every single one of these records had, you know, one and a hundred in it, and then it shows us all the rest of the values that are also in that, in that record. If we just wanted those columns and those values, then we were done. When we just summed them and equals two, we were done. But this allowed us to then go back into the record and now into the, into the full set and just get those records. So this is a way to do a join if you can hold the complete results of both of those things, like, you know, give me the whole column, uh, you know, one and the whole column two. And that's one way to do a join, uh, perfectly reasonable way to do a join. I'm going to now do this again, but with a column range. So I'm going to say, you know, I want all columns, I want to do a join of all columns that begin with 111 and all columns that begin with 222. So, so that would return more. So I'm going to create two iterators now to do that. So I have initialized my iterator, iterator 1 and iterator 2. All right, and so now I'm going to start the first query iterator here by giving it its column range that initializes it, and I get an A1. And then I check to see if A1 is not empty. If it isn't empty, I'm going to then sum it and then call it again until it proceeds. And since it's such a small thing, it only went through that once. Okay. And then now I'm going to do the same thing again with the other iterator and sum them to get together again. OK. All right. And now I'm going to join those two, uh, those, two, those two columns. And that's a way of doing the join with essentially two nested iterators and doing, doing the join that way. So that's something you can do if you couldn't hold the whole column in memory and you wanted to sort of build it up as you went. That's a way to do it with iterators. And then, let's see here. There's an example of, of the results from that. All right. And just so you know, I mean, when you do an SQL query in an SQL database, this is what it's doing under the covers. It's trying to do whatever information it can. It, it will, some lot of database horror hold a lot of internal statistical information. It's trying to figure out, can I hold the results in memory or can I not? Do I have to go through in chunks or, or do I not? Do I have information about, oh, you know, this query, like, you know, do I have a, a sum table, you know, sitting around that will tell me, oh, which, which, you know, which column should I query first because it will return fewer results and then I can go from there type of thing. So, so this is sort of all going under the covers. Here you get the, the power to do that directly uh, on the database, and it's pretty easy to do. Um, so you have, but you do have to understand these concepts. All right, so now we'll move on. Okay, now we've done, so that was all with the adjacency matrix. And as I said before, when we formed the adjacency matrix, we threw away a little information, right? Because if we had multiple, if we had a collision of any kind, right, we lost the distinctness of that, that, that record or that edge. And a lot of times, like, no, we want to keep, keep these edges because, you know, yeah, we'll have other information about those edges and we want to keep things. So, so, so we want to we wanna store that. So we're going to now reinsert the data in the table and use, essentially, instead of an adjacency matrix, an incidence matrix. An incidence matrix, every single row is an edge, and every single uh, column is a vertice. And so an edge can then connect multiple vertices. It also allows us to store essentially what we call hyper edges. So if you have an edge that connects multiple vertices at the same time, uh, we can do that. So let's do that. This, this is inserting about twice as much data, so uh, it naturally takes a little bit longer there. And you see the edge insertion rates that we're getting there, uh, you know, 30,000 30, edges per second. So let's go and see what it did to our, um, our data here. So if we look at our tables, we can see now that our, there's our edge data set. And you see we've inserted about 270,000 distinct entries in this uh, data so there's the edge table and there's this transpose and there's the degree uh, count and as you saw before you know we had 53,000 uh, you know so that just shows you the additional information okay, let me let's look at that uh, 
that program here. So again, we're, we're looping over all our files here. Um, um, we're reading them in. Uh, I should say, in this case, we are reading in the raw text files again. We're not reading in the associative array because we just want to insert those edges. And then the only thing we've done is that basically to create our edge, we had to create this data didn't come with a record label, so we, we don't have any. So we are constructing a unique record label for each edge here, just so that we have it for the row key. And then we're prepending the word out and, you know, out into the row string and in into the column string so that we know, you know, when we create our record, there'll be, you know, out is shows the direction it came from and in shows the direction it, it left. And so that's a way of sort of creating the edge. And then likewise, we do the count uh, 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 degree uh, uh, and such to preserve that information so we can summing the, the no total number of counts there. All right. So let's do some queries on that. Alrighty, so I'm going to get, I'm going to ask for a hundred random vertices here. So I get my random vertices, and then I'm going to uh, do my query of the strings, but I have to prepend the the this out slash then the value in it, so I know I'm looking for 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 uh, uh, you know vertices from which the edge is departing, and I'm going to get those edges. So I get those edges. So I created the query. I get the edges. I'm going to do my thresholding again. I want a certain uh, uh, min and max, and then um, I'm going to do the, the 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 threshold. So this just gave me the degree counts, and I threshold it so that you know between this range. And then now I then do the same thing back with the uh, with the uh, the uh, I, I I say give me everything greater than degree min and less than degree max. I get a new set of rows, so that will just return the edges that are a part of uh, vertices with these degree range, and then I'm going to get uh, all those, uh, all those uh, uh, edges, all the records that contain those, those vertices uh, through this uh, nested query here. And the result is this. So basically, this shows me all the edges that are a part of um, uh, vertices, this random set of vertices that have a degree range between 5 and 10. This is a fairly sophisticated analytic uh, in terms of, you know, we got a lot of, we're doing about seven or eight queries here, uh, doing a lot of mathematics, and you see how, how dense it is. And hopefully, uh, from what we've learned prior, from prior has some some intuition for you. All right, and we'll continue on. All right, so now I'm going to do a query with the iterator. Again, same type of drill. I set the maximum number of elements of the iterator. I get my random set of things. I create an iterator again, setting the number of elements. I initialize the iterator to be over these vertices. I then check to see if the if it returned anything. If it did, um, I'm going to then actually pass that uh, the the rows of that back into the uh, the uh, the uh, uh, into it to get the uh, edges containing those vertices, and then do a sum to compute the in degree and so on and so forth. And then I get here the maximum in degree of that set of vertices was 25. So that's just an example of that. And that was 12, and I think 13 is our last one. All right. And again, a more complicated example showing basically a, a join over this space, uh, creating essentially uh, a couple of, uh, of uh, 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 sets of edges, and a couple of column ranges, uh, iterators, and so on and so forth. And I won't belabor this point, but this just shows how you can combine between using the degree table and iterators 
Uh, you should have you have all the tools at your disposal that uh, any type of query planning system would have inside it that it would use to to make sure that you're not over uh, taxing uh, the results that you're returning. You know, to and that's a lot of times if you do a query on any database and you get the big spinning watch or whatever, it's because the query you asked was was simply too 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 long. Um, it also gives a lot of nice places to, if you're maybe making a, a query system, to, to uh, interrupt it. So you, if you do the query against the counts, you can quickly tell the user, look, you just did a query and this is going to return 10 million results. Do you want to proceed? You know, and so you, of course, could hold it. Or likewise, uh, you can set a, a maximum number of iterations. It's like it says... Okay, I want to get them back in, in, in units of 100,000 entries, but I only want to go up to a million, and then I'm going to pause and you know, get some kind of additional guidance from the user to continue. So those are the same tools and tricks that are in any query planner, you know, very elegantly exposed to you here for managing, uh, managing uh, uh, these types of queries. All right, with that, I want to do some stuff where we do a little bit of bigger data sets so of kind of walk through the examples. I want to kind of show you what this is like running on a bigger, bigger data set. So let's, let's close all that. All right. Close that. And let's see here. Oops. No, that's what I just did. I want to do this one. So now I'm logged into, I just SSH'd into class db02.cloud.llgrid.ll.mit.eu, uh, which happens, it tells you which node it's actually mapped to, which is node F-15-11 in our cluster. And this is a fairly powerful compute node. These are our next generation compute nodes for LLGrid. So those who've been using LLGrid for all these past years may have noticed that the they're getting a little long in the tooth. These are the first set of the new nodes, and we'll have about 500 of them total in various systems. Um, and so here, um, I am uh, doing something a little bit uh, larger. So let me see here. So if I see examples. So I'm on my Elegrid account here, and I'm going to go to three and two. All right, and I do open dots. All right, so that's the directory. And so the first thing I did is in my DB setup here, you'll notice that I have uh, done uh, class DB zero, okay? And also we don't need to do one, but I will do two here. I've made this bigger. So I've made this now two to the 18th vertices instead of what I had before. So let's go that anymore. So if I do pdb02, it's going to now generate these things. And so it's generating a lot more data, and you see it's doing it about a couple hundred thousand vertices per second. Just shows you a difference between the capability of my laptop and one of these one of these servers here. Okay. And this will also, I'm logged onto the system. It has 32 cores. I can do things in parallel. And so, for instance, if I did eval p run, for those of you who have had the parallel MATLAB training, I can say before. And if I just, since I'm logged into this node and I just do curly brackets, it says just launch locally on that node, don't launch onto the grid. And now it's launching that in parallel on this node. Data one, did that. Data two, did that. Now it's done. And the others finished their work to probably right about now. So that's just an example of being able to do things in parallel. You know, we've created here, I mean, you look at it, uh, we did, uh, you know, what, eight times 300,000? We did two and a half million edges in that, in that essentially five seconds type of thing. So we receive, you know, a state magic multiplies by four. You're doing like a million edges a second just in that one, one type of, of calculation there. 
move on to PDB03. And, um, oh, I should say I did modify that program slightly. Let's see here. Uh, right. So if I look at the, the line labeled in big capital letters parallel, I uncommented it. That's what allows each one of the processors when they launch to then work on different files. Otherwise, they all would have worked on the same, the, you know, the same files. So by uncommenting that parallel, uh, this now becomes a parallel program that I can run with the eval p run command. Of course, you have to have parallel MATLAB installed, which of course you all do since you're on Hello Grid. But um, for anyone seeing this on the internet, they would need to to have that software installed too, which is also available on the web and and installable there. So that's all we needed to do is uncomment that one line to make that program parallel and did the right thing for us as well. And we're going to go on to the next example and we did the same thing there. We did, we just uncommented parallel and it's now going to, you know, create these associated arrays in parallel. So if I do PDB3 OSOS test, it's now actually constructing these associated arrays. You see it takes about four seconds to do each one of those. It's doing them at about 120, you know, 30,000 entries per second. So this thing will take about 25 seconds to do the whole, the whole thing. And again, if we ran that in parallel, It automatically tries to kill the last job you ran if you were in the same directory so that you're not stomping on top of yourself. And now you see it's doing that again. And now it's done. So again, and the other ones have finished as well. You can actually check that if you really want to. Just control Z if I do more. Add MPI star dot out. You can see those are the output files of each one of them. I'm not lying. They didn't take a ridiculous amount of time. They all completed. You know, I always encourage people to check those .out files in that mat MPI directory. That's where it sends all the standard out from all the other nodes. It's probably the number one feedback we get from a user who says, my job didn't run. We're like, what does it say in your .out files? And usually like, oh, there's an error on node 3 because this calculation is wrong on that particular node or something like that. So just reminding, reminding folks of that. Moving on, so that was, uh, what did we just do? We did three, so we did PDB04. Uh, retest. This is doing a little bit bigger calculation, and so you can see here, I told you it does begin to get bigger here. So it started out, you know, the first iteration was about 0.6 seconds, and then it goes on to 0.8 seconds. Um, if we did that cat approach, um, it would do it. It would do it faster. Um, I'll show you a little neat trick. With this is also a parallel program. When I run it, and um, basically, I, I loop over each files here. Um, I'm just doing this to this little ag thing just to sync sync the processors just for fun, so I don't have to wait for them to start. Um, and then it's going to go, and they're going to do their sums. And then when they're all done, they're going to call this globe. So each one will have a local sum, and it needs to be pulled together. So we have this function called gag, which basically takes associate arrays, and we'll just sum them all together. And very nice um, um, tool for doing that. And of course, we had to uncomment that in order for that to work. And so let's go give that a try. And so if we do eval p run. So it's launching them, and it's reading, and then it's going to have to wait a second. Okay, so then it took about two seconds to pull them all together and do the sum across those processors. So that's a parallel computation, um, you know, a classic example of what people do with LL Grid and can do with D4M is they have a bunch of files. Each processor 
process them independently, and at the end they pull something all together uh, using this uh, either this 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 uh, gag gag command. All right, moving on. So now, uh, I'm on uh, database two here. So I'm going to go to that. Let's look at our tables. Very little activity. You see, we have no tables there, so I have to create them. So I'm going to do pd db setup 05. That's going to create those tables on that that database. All right. And now look and see. Voila, created all our my tables, so now I'm ready to go. And now we're going to do the insert again, PDB06. I'm going to insert the adjacency matrix. And this obviously takes a little bit longer. Uh, just each one of these, uh, well, there's a parameter associated with the table, which is, you would think normally it should just send all its data to the database at once. But it turns out one thing we found is that actually it prefers, the database prefers to receive the data in a smaller increment, typically around half a megabyte chunk. So every single time it's calling this, it's sending half a megabyte, waiting to get the all clear again, and then setting the next one. And we've actually found that that makes a fairly significant issue. So you can see here we're getting about 60 thousand inserts per second. Uh, this is from one one processor and this takes a little while. Uh, let's see if we can go and look at it while it's going on. Go here, we should begin to see some. So there you go. See that's that's what a real insert's beginning to look like. It just changes its axis for you uh, uh, dynamically here, but we're getting about 600, uh, 60,000 uh, inserts a second there. You just go along here it'll start leveling off a little bit. And I'll show you what's going on in the tables there. And just, I mean, you know, not too many of you are probably database aficionados, but 60 thousand inserts a second on a single node database is pretty darn amazing. I mean, you would mostly have had to use a parallel database. And that's actually one of the great powers of accumulators. There's a lot of problems. Even though it's a parallel database, there's a lot of problems you can now do with a single node database that you would have had to have a parallel system to do before. And that's really because, you know, parallel computing is a real pain. I mean, I should know. And, uh, and so one of the best, if you can make if you can make your parallel problem fast enough to now work on a single one, that's really uh, a tremendously convenient uh, capability. All right, so we inserted there, what, 8 million uh, uh, entries, right? So pretty impressive. Um, but that did take a while, you know, and so maybe I want to do that in parallel. So if I just do eval p run, and let's try, let's try four. Let's see what happens. Now I'd expect actually this to begin to top this thing out, and so the individual inserts rates on each node probably go down a little bit. And you'll see it'll get a little bit noisy here because now we have four separate processes all doing inserts. You see there was one, it took a little bit of almost a second. You can get this noise beginning to happen here. But we're getting 50,000 edges per second on one node, which means we should be getting, you know, like close to four times that. So let's go check what, what's it seeing here. So if we update that. And there you see, we're sort of now climbing the hill, uh, well over 100,000. That was our first insert there. And now we're entering the second one here. Oops, don't want to check my email, do I? Sorry. Um, let's see here, so how are we doing there? Oh, it's done. So, uh, I don't even know if we got, we, we may not even gotten the full rise time of that. Yeah, so it basically finished before we could even hit the, really hit the, you know, it has a little filter here 
has a certain resolution. You really need to do an insert for about 10 minutes before you can get really a sense of that. But, uh, you know, there you, you see, you know, we probably got over 200,000 inserts a second using four processes on, on one node. And so, again, and we could probably keep on going up this ramp. You know, for this data set, I'd expect we'd be able to get maybe 500,000 inserts a second if I kept adding processors and stuff like that. And again, so, and if you look at our data, right, you know, what do we got here? Well, we got like 15 million entries now in our database. Again, one of the nice things is for typical databases, a lot of times, like, if you have to re-ingest the whole database, that's fine. In our cyber program, we have a month of data, and we can re-ingest it in a couple hours. And that's a very powerful tool to be able to, like, oh, you know what, I didn't like the ingestion. That's fine. I'll just rewrite the ingestion and redo it. And this is gives you a very powerful tool for exploring your data here. So that's kind of what I want to do with that. Um, one of our students here very generously um, gave me some Twitter data, and so I wanted to show you a little bit uh, with that Twitter data because it's probably maybe a, a hair more meaningful than this uh, abstract chronicle graph uh, data. And by definition, Twitter data is about the most public data that one could one can imagine. I think no one who posts to Twitter is expecting any sense of, of privacy there. So I think we can we can use that okay. So let's see here. Let me uh, get out of that. Right. And that. So the desktop. So Twitter. Right, and so basically just a few examples here. The first thing we did is construct the associative array. So let's start up here. And I think it was like a million Twitter, is that right? A million, a million, a million entries, and how many Twitter, how many tweets do you think that was? Uh, well, we should be able to find out, right? We should be able to find out, so. So it's reading these in and chunked and writing them out to associated arrays. That's going to be annoying, isn't it? Instead of a faster system. So this is running on the database system. And I broke it up into chunks of 10. I couldn't quite, on my laptop, fit the whole thing in one associated array. So I broke it up into chunks of 10. Yeah, see, we're still cruising. Yeah, that's good. All right, so that just reads it all in. In fact, we can take a look at that file. So we go to the desktop. So I just took that exact same example and just put his data in. So just to take a look at what that involved. Pretty much all the same. I, uh, there was, it was one big file, but I couldn't process it. I mean, I could read it in. Each one of the, the row, he, he did a great job of creating into triples, and I can easily hold those triples. But I couldn't quite construct the associative array. Um, and so I basically just go through and find all the separators and then basically take them out of the, 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 the vector in memory. And so that's what I'm doing here is I'm looping over um, um, here. So basically I get, I read in all the data, I find all the, the separators, and then I go through and it's a little bit of a messy calculation to basically do them in these particular blocks. And then I can construct the associated array and save those out uh, no problem. And let's see here, so what else do we do? We did, uh, uh, we can do it in a little degree calculation from that data. So it's now reading each one of those and computing the degrees. Okay. 
errors. And I think we can do the same thing on this system. Pretty fast. then to let's create some tables. Okay, so I created a special class of tables for that. Just modify that. Let's do it again. If you go over here, who was on this one? Nope, I did it on the other database. So database one. Get tables. Oh, all right, so all I was doing there was, on the other one, was plotting the degree distribution. So this shows us, you know, so for each tweet, oops, I did a little analog there. For each tweet, uh, let's go to figure one. For each tweet, all right, are you done? It's very Twitter-like. No, no one has ever done in Twitter. Uh, so, wow, what did I do? I went to town, didn't I? You done now? All right, so we got to figure one. All right, you see for each tweet, this shows us how much information was in each tweet. And you see that on average, just because he basically parsed out each word uh, uniquely. So this just shows that there's about a thousand pieces of information associated with each uh, each tweet, which seems a little high, so we should probably double check that. Um, and then, what did I do? So we loaded all of them up, we summed the degrees, and then, oh, what I said, I show me all the locations greater than, with, with, the, with crowns greater than 100, and all the, and then uh, all the words with the, uh, at signs greater than 100 and all the hashtags greater than 50. So that's what these other guys are. So so this was the essentially for each tweet how many you have. Um, if we go to figure two, this shows the degree distribution of all the words and other things in there. So there's some guy here who's really really high. In fact, we can find him out. Um, and so, but as of course most things you know occur only once, cited once. Like there's a lot of unique keys in like the, there's the message ID, which of course is probably something that only appears once. Uh, if we go to figure three, so this just shows like the locations, and this was tweets from the day before the hurricane, or the week, the Wednesday before the hur Hurricane Sandy, and so this shows us, you know, uh, but in the, limited to the, kind of the New York area or something like that, or? Yeah, 40 miles around New York City. 40 miles around New York City, so basically this shows us all the locations here, and you see so this is a classic example of the kind of things you want to do because the first thing that we see is that we have some problems with our data, which is uh, New York City and New York City space. Got to go in and correct all those, right? So that's a classic example. This is really what D4M, it's the number one thing that people do with D4M is it's the first time that you really can like do sums and tallies over the entire data set and these things just pop out. They stick out like a sore thumb. You know, like, oh, got to correct that. You know, you can either correct it in the database or correct it afterwards in the query. But that just immediately improves the quality of everything else you have. And then there's this clutter one, like location none, right? Well, clearly, you'd want to just kind of get rid of that or do something with that. And then just plain old normal spelled New York. So most people can spell correctly, and so we're, we're good. But location iPhone, I mean, what's that about, you know? Uh, Jersey City, well, we don't care about that, you know, so. Uh, South Jersey, well, what's... South Jersey people don't know that they're 40 miles from New York, I guess, or... <laughs> Whatever they have in their, in their profile. So a lot of people in South Jersey who uh, say they're from New York. So, I guess, uh, what's her name from Jersey Shore? Snooky, right? Snooky says she's actually from New York City, not not Jersey's, not South Jersey. So, so, uh, so there's a great example of that. And then um, let's see here, Figure Four. 
So this just shows all the uh, the at signs. So you see basically, uh, damn it's true is like the most, is this like a retweeted thing or something? Or it's, I don't know. I don't know what the, what does the at sign mean again? It means to, uh, another user. to a new, to a user. So most people tweet to damn it's true in New York. There you go. Uh, funny fact, uh, relatable quote. Uh, and then Donald Trump, the real Donald Trump, and then just word at sign. So those are another example. You know, uh, anything here is a hilarious idiot, bad gal V, and Marilyn Monroe ID. I mean, so there you go. A lot of, lot of, lot of fun stuff there on Twitter. Um, but this is sort of, he's going to establish his background, and then let's go back and look at during the hurricane. So this is all basically the normal situation and then you know very clear, clearly and then the uh, the hashtags right so we can look at the hashtags so what do we got here uh, favorite movie quotes and favorite movie quotes misspelled right up there the Knicks and then what I love the most and all this type team follow back I don't know team auto no what's this word what's TFB no one knows Maybe we should don't want to know. So, uh, so you can always look that up in Urban Dictionary. And then, it's a bad one. All right. Okay. Good. Well, then we'll leave it at that. Won't add that to the video. Um, so continuing on here, let's see. Uh, uh, da, da, da. Well, you get the idea. And so all these examples they work in parallel too. Uh, you get a lot of speed up. Lots of interesting stuff like that, but that's very classic, the kind of thing you do. You get data, you parse it, you maybe stick it in MATLAB files to do your initial sweep through it, but then if it gets really, really big and you want to do sort of more detailed things and you insert in the database, you can do queries there, leverage using your counts so that you don't accidentally, you know, you can imagine if we put all the tweets in the world and you had location in New York City and you looked at it, you had to like, give me all this set of locations and one of them was New York City, you'd be like, oh my God, I've just you know, have done a query that's going to give me 5% of all the data back. Well, it's going to just flush your system. But if you can just do the count and be like, oh, New York City's got a million entries, don't touch that one, you know, or put an iterator on that one, right, you know, so that, uh, so that I only handle it in manageable chunks. So, uh, so I want to thank you. So hopefully this was worth it. Uh, we have one more class, which deals with a little bit of wrapping up some of the theory, uh, kind of on this stuff and some stuff on performance metrics. And then in two weeks, for those of you who signed up, we have the Accumulo folks coming in, showing you how to run your own uh, database, um, you know, all day on just, you know, um, you know, we're setting up a database for you, for you guys on LL Grid, but you're definitely going to run in with your customers. Accumulo instances, it's good to know some basics about that because a lot of times you're not going to have all the kind of nice nice stuff that we've provided, and it's good to know how to set up your own Accumulo and interact with that in the field. So with that, that brings the lecture to the end, and happy to stay for any questions if anybody has them.